Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be with you here as we gather and as we look again at the book of Mark. So if you don't have your, your Bibles open yet, we're still in chapter one. I want to encourage you to open there now. And uh, we've been looking at, uh, since Easter, the life of Jesus. Often we tend to focus on the death, burial, and resurrection, which is incredible news. The gospel, this incredible power of Jesus risen from the grave. But oftentimes we forget to look at his life is what led up to that. And so through the book of Mark, we're going to continue to dive in and look at who is Jesus and what was his ministry like and what was he like as he walked here on earth. Uh, and also last week, we really focused in on the idea of following Jesus. I, I would just encourage you in this journey together to think about joining the disciples as we're reading together. Imagine through the lens of the disciples, what was it like for them? Remember, they, they're going to leave their fishing nets. We read that last week. They're going to be called to follow this, this rabbi Jesus. And then we're going to see today, he's going to start to do some incredible things to reveal who he really is. And what would it have been like for them? And for many of you, you might be thinking, yeah, I'd like to know more about who Jesus is. And that's part, part of the heart that we have today. So I want to start, I need to give you a little bit of a foundation to really help us get into today's words. So uh, before we get into the text, uh, let me ask you a question. What do you believe about angels and demons? What do you believe about angels and demons? Uh, there's a Gallup poll that was done. That's a nationwide poll last year. And in their survey, they found out that 74% of the United States, who they surveyed, 74% 74 believe in God. And then, surprisingly to me, 69% believe in angels, and then 58% believe in the devil. And they didn't specify demons or not, but they they kind of categorize this. And I was shocked to see, well, one, 74%. And I would expect that the 74% who believe in God would also believe in angels and believe in the devil. Because we look in the text and that's what we see. In fact, uh, if you weren't here last week, this is a really important part. We saw Jesus being ministered to by angels and tempted by Satan. And so the, the theology around angels and demons and around Satan is very critical to what we're going to teach today and what the Bible reveals about a spiritual world around us. And so the first thing I want to point out is that angels in general, angels, the, the word angels is not the title of them. It's a job description. The word angel in essence means a messenger. So these are messengers of God. And so I want to point out a couple of things before we move on. Um, there's a lot of terminology that you're going to see throughout the book of Mark and throughout Scripture re re referencing angels and then, of course, referencing demons. And so these are some of the, the, the words that you're going to see that demons or spiritual forces that are opposed to God come up as spirits or as demons or as evil spirits or unclean spirits or deceitful spirits or fallen angels. And I want to just put the, in the room that there is a reality of a spiritual battle. And rather than going in to try to explain all aspects of this and a lot of the theology around angels and fallen angels and demons, I think we do need to uh, come to the understanding and agreement that the scripture is clear. There is a spiritual battle that is occurring around you and me that we don't see. And we honestly, we can't even, I think, fully comprehend. I do know that for those that know the book of Ephesians that Paul writes and he says, put on the armor of God, like there is a battle, you are waging war. And you're going to see throughout the text, throughout today and, and throughout the book of Mark, where Jesus is going to interact very clearly with spirits and demons and evil spirits and so on. And uh, one of the things I, I think is interesting, so when we go to Cambodia, they, uh, in fact, when we were there in February, they, they did an animal sacrifice, uh, one of the villages. Before we went to proclaim God and celebrate the translation of the Bible, uh, the village people there, they wanted to have a sacrifice. And uh, they are very aware that spiritual forces are interacting around them. Uh, so they try to appease the spirits. And you and I don't generally, I think, 
attribute much to spirits. I think sometimes we just hide it. Sometimes we don't really want to agree that maybe it's happening. Or, or worse yet, we want to blame everything on the devil or on a spirit. Every time I sin, well, the, the devil made me do it, or it's some kind of evil force around me, when the fact is you and I, we have an interaction of our own problem called sin. And, and our flesh, it does not align with God's heart and desire. And so uh, as we walk through the text, just be aware that in Cambodia and many parts of the world and in the text today, uh, demonic possession and, and spirits moving around them was kind of expected. It was normal. It was around them all the time. They were very aware of it because they're very real and very influential. But for you and me, I think in America, we tend to ignore that or push that away. And even in my preparation for speaking about this, I realized that I think the enemy, the devil, I think he desires that we not talk about him. In fact, the less we can talk about him, the more he's free to move around. And I want to encourage you that there is a very real spiritual battle around us. But what we're going to find today is we have a very real higher power, though that Jesus is incredibly powerful. And so uh, let's jump into a couple of key statements before we get into the text. One more I want you to hear. One, angels, they were created by God. They were created and are created by God. This is really critical. They are not created of their own, and they are not equal opposites to God. And uh, there's, there's a lot of confusion about are, are demons fallen angels or what does that look like? And just for the, for, for the purposes of today, just angels and demons or angels and fallen angels, they were, they were created by God. Two, they are not all-powerful. In fact, you're going to find that God is all-powerful in our story today. You're really going to see that on display. They're not omnipresent. That means, see, God is omnipresent. He's with you. He's with me. He's everywhere. He is fully activated in all places and spaces. Uh, that is not true of angels and demons. They, they can only be in one place at a time. And so that's good news for us because it means that Satan can't be here and there simultaneously. He can only be in one place at a time. And finally, they are not omniscient. In other words, they're not all-knowing. They don't know everything. They know who Jesus is. They know about God, but they're not all knowing like our great creator God is. Um, In fact, it's very clear that uh, Jesus even says, no one knows when this is all going to end, when the end times will come, only the Father in heaven. So that's good enough for me that these angels, these demons, they're not all knowing. So let's take that just basic idea that it is scripturally found throughout the text from Genesis to Revelation that angels and demons are interceding and interacting around us, and God is in control of all these things. And so let's step into the sandals of the disciples. Follow with me, verse 21. I'll put it on the screen for you, chapter 1, verse 21. We're going to walk through a section of this text, and uh, hopefully, like the disciples, you too will perhaps learn a little bit more about who Jesus truly is. So let's begin uh, on verse 21. And they've just left their fishing nets. They've left uh, their father. These, uh, these two sets of brothers are on their way with Jesus. And in, in perfect form, Mark loves to talk about the immediacy of how everything happened, but I'm sure they walked quite a distance. Anyhow, anyhow verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, For he had taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent. And we'll pause for just a moment. This is a a powerful moment. Just get in the room with me, okay? You've just left your fishing nets. You're in the synagogue. Jesus then has a conversation with a demonic spirit and tells him to be quiet, to be silent. You hear perhaps out of the mouth of this man, this, this, you've, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The demons recognize Jesus and his power. Have you come to destroy us? 
Get yourself there because according to the book of Mark, the recollection here, this is their first encounter with what Jesus is going to be proving and showing throughout his ministry of who he really is. How do you think they responded? How would, how would you respond? Let's continue on here. It says, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits. This is, this is an incredible moment. If I were writing this or if I were in the room, I think it would say, after this guy convulsed and was shaking and out of him comes a demon, I think my answer would be, and they were freaked out. Because if that was the first thing I had experienced with Jesus, I might be questioning, should I have left my business of fishing? Who is this I'm really following? I wonder what the response was of the disciples in this moment. Was it fear? Was it confusion? Was it celebration? What was their response as they watched this happen? And do you ever wonder yourself, have you experienced Jesus kind of interacting in your life and said, whoa, what, what just happened? Is this, this real? Is, am I really experiencing God working? The story goes on here. It says, he commanded even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now, just pause there. Remember, if you weren't a part of the message last week, I want to encourage you to go back and watch that when you have time because Pastor Jason unpacked these two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew. And we do often reference Simon as Simon Peter, but I'm going to just use him as Simon today. Um, but so Simon and Andrew are brothers, James and John are brothers. And it says, verse 30 now, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. And so immediately they took him about her. So they took, they told him about her, sorry. They took Jesus and said, listen, uh, my mother-in-law is sick. And he came up and took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her. And she began to serve them. What a great response. The, the response that she had is not, I need a nap. <laughs> the response wasn't, oh, I need to clean the house. It's just, I just need to serve you. Look at how you've, you've removed this fever. My guess is that this fever was far more than just, you know, the common cold. It was probably a very serious illness that she was going through and people were concerned. And so Jesus comes in, lifts the fever. 30, verse 32 says, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And very... Uh, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. I think it's important we pause for a moment. Look at the response of Jesus. So he's been casting out demons. He's been healing people. He's been surrounded by just so many people, they can't even like stack them into the areas they're going. And as somebody who gets pretty exhausted when I gather around lots of people, uh, I know the exhaustion but you would think that because Jesus is God in the flesh, that wouldn't impact him. But I think what we find is, even though Jesus is here and it's the, the full embodiment of the glory of God, he still goes to pray. What he does, I believe, is models for us what we must endeavor to do, that his relationship was, with the Father was dependent on it. He depended on that relationship. Because he knows his next thing, he's going to go forward. He's going to continue to go and preach the good news and, and heal and cast out demons. But he has to have the source. He has to have a direct relationship with the Father. In fact, you'll see Jesus continually commenting that apart from the Father, I do nothing. I only do the Father's will. So how does he know the Father's will? Through prayer, through relational prayer, time with the Father. Um, it reminds me of you and me. We've, we talked through the blessed rhythm, and it's in your sermon notes. But this idea, begin your day in prayer. Let God speak through you and to you before you go into the world. 
So we do have a problem here. If we decide that we can minister to the world without a connection to the head, the head of the church, Jesus, to the Father through the Spirit, if we think we can do that on our own, then we're, we're really mistaken. In fact, um, in 1945, there's this chicken. This chicken's name is Mike. And Mike the chicken um, was set for the dinner table. And after the axe fell, Mike started to run around like most chickens do, like a chicken with their head cut off. But what's interesting about Mike is he didn't fall down. <laughs> Mike the chicken lasted 18 months. He lived without a head for 18 months. Where the ax fell, enough of the brain was left for him to survive with all the body functions. And the owner fed him through a little like eyedropper, 18 months. Months. And it makes me think about you and I. We can, we can run around and look really busy like chickens with our head cut off. If we're not connected to the head, though, that's all we're going to be. Very busy, here and there, looking like we know what we're doing. But if we're not directly in connection with the Father, like Jesus, we will find ourselves very busy, but not very productive. So I want to encourage you to think about what is your relationship with the Father? What's your prayer life like Jesus, God in the flesh modeled the necessity of a dependence on the Father. And I think we should take that and begin to evaluate, do we have that much connection? Do we realize the necessity of that? Verse 36, while Jesus is praying, Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there, for that is why I came out. He was on mission. He's ready to go. And he went through all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. And moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Look at the heart of Jesus. Let's not forget that for a rabbi, this leprous man, if Jesus touches him, makes him unclean in the view of the law. And instead, what he does is he cleanses him. He heals him. And it says that he had pity on him. His heart was broken for this person whose skin sores were brutal. And so he wills it, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean, verse 43. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for yourself cleansing what Moses commanded. So he's still in the old covenant. You have to go through the ceremony. Go prove your cleanliness though and walk through what's required of you. Um, for proof to them in verse 45. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in the desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. This is an intriguing mystery, uh, often re referred to as kind of like the messianic secret. Why is Jesus first, he's telling the demons, be quiet, don't even talk. And then he just says, you don't get to talk, period. He silences them. But then he obviously says to the man who's been healed of leprosy, don't go speak, don't go share anything. And well, naturally he does. He can't help contain the excitement of his life. But there is an unveiling that Jesus needs to do so that people generally want to see him, not just receive perhaps the benefits of him. And I hope in our message, as we walk through these three points I want to draw out today, that you will see Jesus and desire him, not just desire, desire the benefits of Jesus. And so the first thing I want to sort of wrestle with you through and make a statement is that Jesus reveals his authority. I can't tell you how many times I have heard people say, and even my own walk, why didn't Jesus just come out and say, here I am, I'm God in the flesh. And people say frequently who don't yet know the Bible or from other uh, religious cults who have a different view about Jesus, he never said he was God. He never said it. He never. And what you're going to find, he does more than just proclaim it audibly because he does do that. He's going to prove it in his actions. He's going to prove his authority. So he does not just say he's Jesus. 
He's going to do way more than that. Let's take a look at a few key points that I want to draw out. Um, Speaking of his authority, though, um, one of the challenges, we're in the Gospels. And the Gospels set up the life of Jesus leading up to the resurrection. But you and I are recipients of the proof that Jesus has risen. And so the Apostle Paul is one of those apostles, formerly known as Saul, who wrote many books in the Bible as somebody who, was in, who encountered Jesus after the resurrection and his life was transformed. Formerly a persecutor of Christians, now one of the great leaders and great authors that God used his spirit to author his word through. And look what he says in Ephesians about the authority of Jesus, referring to how God, when he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, look at how his authority is is stated. Verse 21, far above all rule, far above all authority, far above all power, far above all dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Jesus is revealing that authority. He's going to walk us through, as we look at the book of Mark, we are going to see Jesus' authority being continually revealed. Let's start with where he reveals his authority here in verse 21. Just going back now, he says, he went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching and they were astonished at his teaching for he taught as one who had authority. He taught as one who had authority. This this is an important key to what Jesus is trying to show them. So first thing, the scribes, this is important to know, the scribes, these Jewish leaders, they were often seated in the highest places, in the most authority in the synagogues. They watched over the scrolls, the ancient texts of the Torah. They were ones people often quoted when teaching and went to to seek wise counsel. And they're looking and they're watching him teach. And it says he, they, they recognized, they were astonished. He taught as one who had authority. This does not mean Jesus was an intellectual giant. That's not what they're referring to. Yes, he was very wise. But they're not saying he taught as one who had authority because he was an intellectual giant. They're not saying he was a smooth talker. Like the way he spoke just was like, oh, it just melts my heart and blows my mind. That's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about he was super entertaining and cracked the best jokes. He says he taught as one who had authority. Jesus had authority of his word. His authority was his word. The scribes and the teachers of the day, they would have continually quoted other teachers, other scribes. This person says, that person says in relation to the scripture. But Jesus spoke as if it was God himself. In fact, that's what we know to be the truth. He he spoke with the power of the spirit and he quoted no one else. He spoke with authority. It is written. Listen, I'm sharing you. This is my heart. Imagine what that was like for them. He didn't have to rely on the expertise of others. He was the expert. He was the author. He is the authority. Have you ever experienced God's word in that way? Have you ever been reading God's word or had somebody share God's word to you in such a way that you were stepped back in amazement? One, maybe it revealed something in your heart or two, maybe it it brought comfort in a way that you didn't know was possible. This is what they encountered. They weren't just amazed at how great this guy was. They were blown away by the authority he carried. Jesus has authority of his word. Next thing I want us to look at is how he interacted with the sick. It said he healed many who were sick with various diseases. And so we saw a woman with a fever. We saw a man who had leprosy. And it says many were healed. See, Jesus has the power. He has the ability. But you might remember what the leper said. He says, if you will. And Jesus, of course, replied, I do will. I, it is my will that you'd be healed. And I just want to be sensitive to this for a moment because I've, I've walked through many seasons where I prayed for healing over family and over friends. And the question that we always have to wrestle with is, his will and my desire. 
See, my desire is that, that my friend would be healed, that my wife would not have illness. My, my desire is that this would happen. And then do I trust God's will, though? Notice in the text, it says he healed many. It didn't say he healed everybody. And I just want to ask the question, do you trust his authority? Do you trust that Jesus' authority and his will are better even than my desire? I know this is a challenge we all walk through. Why, God, why? I, I pray, I, I push hard, I, I desire this in my heart, I strive, I yearn for this healing, this blessing, this job, and yet... What is your will? And Jesus ultimately wrestled the same way. If you might remember, before he goes to the cross, he's in the garden praying and he's bleeding, you know, this sweat, blood, and he just says, God, if there's any way to remove this, if there's any other way we can accomplish your mission. But he says, not my will, your will be done. So do you trust his will? One of the great news, we're, we're not gonna press into as much about um, just sin in general, but he has authority over disease. He has authority over death to keep disease from people. But ultimately, he has the greatest authority, and that's over our sin. We'll be looking at that more next week. The gospel declares this truth, that even if you were healed today physically, there's still an eternity that matters. And that eternity is dependent on your belief in Jesus. His opening of Mark, he says, that you would repent and believe in the gospel. And the gospel says that there will be a day if your faith is in Christ where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more sickness. That's the power that Jesus brings, the power to secure your eternity, even if today he may not fulfill the desire of your heart. It's a challenge, it's tough, but do you trust him? So he has authority over disease and over death. But there's one last thing that we saw. So not only is he a great teacher with authority speaking his word, not only does he have the power over disease and death, but look what it says this last verse here in 34. And he cast out many demons and he would not permit them to speak because they knew him. See, Jesus has authority over demons. I want to remind you that, that he created everything. This is really critical. He's in charge of all these things. And, and I don't understand the fullness of how, what are demons fully and how do they come about and what does this look like? Are they only fallen angels? Are they something else? I don't know. I, I, I think there's a lot of mystery. I do know that they're real because Jesus interacted with them. I do know that they're real because he casts them out. I do know they're real because he silences them and the witnesses observed it. I do know they're real because they know him and James, the book of James, it says, and they shudder in his presence. I do know they're real and I know they are powerless in relation to Jesus. Throughout the scriptures, you will see where even Satan himself was limited by what he could do to Job, was limited by how he can interact because God is ultimately in control. And I'm so grateful that that brings me comfort because there is a spiritual battle around you and me and the, the enemy, as it says, he, he roars around like a, prying, a prowling lion, <laughs> saying the words wrong today. But he, he goes around and he's looking, waiting to devour anything. He just has to keep you distracted but he wants to steal and kill and destroy. He doesn't want you to have life in Christ. But Jesus says, I've already defeated him. The gospel declares that for those in Christ, there is no power that can overtake you or take you from the Father. I hope that brings you hope. I wanted to close with another writing from the Apostle Paul. I think this helps bring to clarity something as we've watched Jesus in the power of his word, the power over disease and death and the power over demons. I want you to hear how in Colossians, Paul phrases this as we come to a conclusion. It says this in chapter one, verses 16 and 17, speaking of Jesus, for by him, 
all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. This is Paul again, writing on the other side of the resurrection. The disciples are looking to this day when it will be declared that everything is under his rule and reign. Everything. And you and I are recipients of that truth today. You see, I I think it's important that we look at this. The disciples, I believe the disciples were shocked at what they were seeing happen. Maybe even questioning, was this the right move? Should I have left my job? Was this really the right guy to follow? See, they're early in the journey, and some of you are too. And And I want to tell you, yes, he is the right one to follow. The invitation is still good. Come and follow me. The teachers in our story were amazed. They marveled at what he was saying and the authority in which he spoke. And of course, the demons, they tremble. They shudder before him. So let me ask you this question. How about you? How how do you interact with Jesus? How do you think about Jesus? How do you see Jesus? Jesus, do you trust his authority? We opened up the book of Mark with Jesus' words. He says, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. How do you deal with his authority? And do you trust it? I love you guys so much. See you next time, and I'll release to the campus pastors. So how do you deal with Jesus' authority? And so I want to have you walk away today with this question. I'd love for you to wrestle with this. Where does Jesus need to have authority in your life? Like, is Jesus truly the authority of your life? If you say, yes, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, you had an invitation that says, Jesus, I'm going to give you my authority, which isn't anything, but I thought it was really powerful. And I want to receive your authority. I want to follow you and get to know you. I want to give you permission to go into my heart and clean house. I want to give you permission to do with me as you will. I want to give you permission to let your will reign even when my desires are different. So where does Jesus need to have authority in your life? Is there an area of your life that you're withholding from him? Is there something uh, in you that you say, you can have all of this, but there's this one part of me I just don't think you can forgive fully. Really? Doesn't he have all authority? I want to encourage you to evaluate your heart this week. And if you've never surrendered your life fully to Christ, I want to encourage you to go before him now. Just fall on your knees and say, Jesus, I desire your authority. And his word says to repent. In other words, to confess who you are, the sin of your life, and then to turn away from it and turn toward him and belief. I love you guys. Let me pray for you before you go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and thank you that uh, it is your authority that guides us, that leads us in your spirit, that opens truth to our eyes. I pray for everyone listening if they don't yet know you, that they would open their eyes, that the Spirit of God would intercede in a powerful way today. Thank you for the authority of Jesus. We give you all praise. We love you, and we ask for your leading in our life. Have your way, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. See you next time.